Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with the Tim May Podcast, special edition, coming to you uh, from South Florida. We're with my buddy, Jeff Snook. Uh, we're coming to you basically uh, as we record this 12 hours after Ohio State was beaten thoroughly by Alabama, 52-24, to in the 2020 college football playoff national championship game in Hard Rock Stadium, just north of Miami. And uh, Jeff, you and I have seen a lot of football together sometimes and uh, separately going back four decades, really. No offense, but you are that old. Five decades, really. And uh, just what's your take on what we saw in Hard Rock Stadium, just a nutshell? Well, we saw a better team beat Ohio State. You know, last year the season ended, uh, to me it was very Ohio State is very dissatisfied because they believe they were a better team than Clemson. They probably were a better team than Clemson, and they just didn't get the break on about five or six players. They could have gone on to play LSU in the Sugar Bowl. I still believe they would have beaten LSU because the way their corners matched up with uh, Joe Burrow's receivers. So that drove them throughout the whole offseason, and now uh, you know we know about the three games being canceled and everything else and the controversy about them getting in. Their win this year was the revenge game against Clemson in the Sugar Bowl. That had to be as satisfying as any Ohio State win in recent memory. But last night, they just ran into a buzzsaw, a much better team. And let's face it, that team we saw last night in Alabama was by far the best team in college football. So the best team in college football, again, won the national championship. So it was a just result, in my opinion. You know, I agree with everything you just said. I was just on a radio show with uh, Bo Bishop and James Laurinaitis at 97.1 the fan in Columbus and uh, you know like James was talking about he was part of that 2006 team that beat Michigan in the game of the century and then turned around and got beat 41-14 by Florida <coughs> in the uh, Fiesta Bowl for the you know BCS National Championship did not go down easy but uh, sometimes the other team is just better you know and uh, I think Ohio State is dealing with that you know right now as much as anything but that doesn't erase uh, this what Ohio State accomplished up to this point like you just pointed out uh, in the strangest of seasons right I mean fighting for the right to play dealing with COVID-19 uh, just when you really didn't need to be dealing with it and uh, and then the challenges that brought and then of course running into like you said the bus all I call it an aberration uh, in this age of people leaving early <clears throat> transferring etc Alabama had about as complete an offense uh, with a great quarterback, you know, very underrated, great quarterback, directing traffic, etc., and uh, touching the buttons and the dials and making things happen in Mac Jones and uh, the first true wide receiver Heisman Trophy winner in Devontae Smith. Uh, that was just a tough thing, uh, a tough challenge for Ohio State. Yeah, you know, I try to look at the big picture. The big picture is this: you go five months back to the date of the kickoff last night. And the Big Ten canceled the season. So imagine if you remember how all the players felt, how all the fans felt that day. Now you fast forward five months, they're playing for the national title. If you connect those dots, it has to be satisfying. So, yeah. you know, I, and the other big picture point is you look at Alabama, and I think this morning there's two football coaches that are very happy. And those football coaches are Notre Dame's Brian Kelly and Texas A&M's Jimbo Fisher, whose team lost by the identical score. 52 to 24, and he, and he said, you know, there aren't many teams that could stay within four touchdowns of Alabama. And Brian Kelly put up a defense for his team after uh, the playoff loss about they battled, and there aren't any there aren't any teams other than short of the NFL teams that can stay within three touchdowns of Alabama. It turns out they're right. This team was by far the best team in college football. Talent across the board. And, you know, the key is they had so many seniors come back or draft-eligible players come back, like Devontae Smith, Najee Harris, they could be in the NFL right now, and if you can do that, and Nick Saban has the culture to bring them back, they played in the Citrus Bowl a year ago, remember, and, yeah. they, and they drubbed Michigan. And I wrote after that game, when people were writing Alabama off, I said, Mac Jones is going to be a star this year, and they're going to play for it again, because I know, you know, you know, Mick, you know Nick Saban well. When, if you look at his championships, they always follow a disappointment. And uh, the players bought in, and they came back, and 
And that's the tough thing nowadays, and Ohio State faces that every year. When you got draft eligible players that go in the first round, if you can get them back on campus the following year, you got an infinitely better chance of winning the national title. Yeah, and uh, we saw it live <laughs> last night in Hard Rock Stadium, at least as we record this. Um, kind of reminded me, you know, you and I, during an off week for Ohio State the year before, being semi-retired, I get to do some things I didn't get to do way back when I used to work for the dispatch for 42 years. Columbus Dispatch, and uh, we went to the Texas A&M Alabama game at Texas A&M last year, and that was kind of a similar, similar result when you remember it. Tua Tagovailoa was the Alabama quarterback, and there were just these great receivers running around, getting right. getting wide open and catching passes. Uh, Nick Saban, how how long can Nick Saban keep this going on? Man? We know he's 69 years old. And, and by the way, give some praise. He just had his seventh national title, went past Bear Bryant in the pole playoff era, most national titles ever for a major college head coach. Go That's ahead. right. You know, he's 69 years old, and I'll never forget the day I'm standing in St. John Arena. It was approximately January the 7th, 1982. And you were covering that? You were covering Ohio State for who? For the Lantern, uh, the school newspaper. Exactly. That's one of the And I'm that standing there. against the hallway in St. John Arena, and out bust Nick Saban with a box of possessions <laughs> in his hand, stormed past me, and went down the steps. And the reason was he'd just been fired a minute earlier by Earl Bruce. Yeah. And I think about that. I think he was making $22,500 as a secondary coach. And by the way, those previous two years that he coached there were the worst Ohio State secondaries that ever existed. They gave up three school records to opposing quarterbacks. That secondary couldn't cover me. Mike Hohensey, remember him? Yeah, Mike Hohensey. Yeah. And Scott Campbell and Dave Wilson. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so that was where his career was, and he had to take a job at Navy the following year, who they had just beaten two weeks earlier, or a week earlier in the, in the Liberty Bowl, and he bumped into a man named Steve Belichick. Steve Belichick completely resurrected his career, developed a friendship with his son Bill. That led to him uh, getting a defensive coordinator job with the Cleveland Browns. That led to the Michigan State head coach job, which led to LSU, which led to the Dolphins, which led to Alabama. He is now a legend who they build statues after. Uh, outside Bryant Denny Stadium, he's got seven titles. Yeah. He's richer than rich. He makes $8 million a year. His net I, worth is I, probably 100 million. Aflac, go ahead. Yes, so when you think about how things come full circle, and at that time he was 31 years old, now he's 69 years old, he's a certified legend, and uh, you and I talked last night, I thought, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if he hung it up, but this morning I got up and read his quotes, and he's just talking the opposite. As long as I'll have him and he's enjoying it, he's going to come back. That dynasty's not done yet. The way he recruits and the way he coaches, and I see he's going to hire Bill Bryan to replace uh, Sark, so that offense will continue clicking. Uh, there's more titles probably ahead for Alabama and Nick Saban. Yeah, well, they got the talent, that's for da damn sure. You know, quickly tell that story, quickly, succinctly. Uh, it was after the, after the near miss, after uh, Ohio State held off Navy in the Liberty Bowl in Memphis, they get back and, and Earl Bruce cleans house defensively. Tell that quick story about how that went down. Well, the way I was, the way I heard it, there's two different versions. Yeah. The version I heard that well, tell I, the good version that I trust, <laughs> that I trust yeah. is Earl was not going to fire Nick Saban. He was going to fire Denny Frizzell and Steve Zabo, who's the linebackers defensive line coach, I believe. And Denny Frizzell was the defensive coordinator. Yeah. Denny Frizzell and Nick Saban were best friends, so that that secondary had given up a tip pass to Minnesota, which cost them the Big Ten title. But they did go on to beat Northwestern, Michigan, and the Liberty Bowl. So they ended with a three-game winning streak, but Earl knew he had to do something. So he comes in a meeting, he announces those two firings. Nick stood up and let him have it, as Nick's temper would tend to do, about you you didn't let us use a scheme, we wanted a more aggressive scheme, we wanted to blitz a little more. He wanted more of an NFL package back then. Earl believed in a bend but don't break, Well, the problem was it, not only was there's a lot of bending, there was a lot of breaking that year. So uh, Nick Saban just wasn't having any of it. Up. He's only 31 years old, but he's telling the head coach off. And Earl looked at him and said, you're fired too. And that's the way he got ushered out the door. So he, he cleaned house all three of them in one day. But I was told, and I think Earl confirmed this years ago, that he was only going to do the first two. And, and Nick, yeah. Nick popped off. And to Nick's credit, recently when I asked him about that, 
a couple years ago, he said, I'd have done the same thing Earl did if one of my assistants talked to me the way I talked to Coach Bruce. Yeah. So he came around and matured and, and realized his mistake, but it's just amazing how his career has taken off and come full circle. Yeah, what he did was he also became a head coach and understood there are times when changes need to be made, sometimes right. with friends, you know, you have to separate. Uh, you know, bottom line is, I, uh, before we move on, uh, I, I just, I've been, People know me, and you know some people hold it against me after a game like this. But I, I, I was going to Alabama games when I was seven years old, and uh, in the early 1960s, as I like to say, I saw Joe Joe Willie Namath play on two good knees. That was, I said that before uh, HBO did, and this was the best Alabama offense I've ever seen. Uh, and you can argue with me all you want, I'm but not just the, argue. the balance they had from big time. I mean, they didn't even—I don't think they even threw the ball their tight end last night. If I remember correctly, and uh, but the bottom line is Najee Harris, yeah, he didn't line up and run right down Ohio State's throat. He didn't need to. His catches out of the backfield, you know, were huge, especially the one he one-handed and turned around and and made great moves and got to the end zone. Uh, I mean, this was a very well-balanced, uh, talented Alabama offense with a, in my opinion, underrated. But maybe not any more quarterback running the show in Mac Jones. Hey, one more thing. Can you imagine their player of the year candidate and their best receiver and their All American coming into this season, Jalen Waddell, gets hurt on a kickoff return against Tennessee, or he would have been healthy in this lineup. Can you imagine that lineup yeah. with with him in there healthy? I mean they were they had, you know, three big superstars in Mac Jones. Najee Harris and uh, Devontae Smith, yeah. and it's just t it's it's tough with Ohio State. On if, say if they would have had everybody healthy with all 13 of their players that weren't here, including uh, two defensive linemen, it would have been tough for them to slow them down. Yeah, and uh, you know the better team won, and you just got to end it with that and put a period on it. Yeah, they missed Tommy Tuggy out for good for sure because the one chance he had was to get pressure up the middle, make Mac Jones move a little bit more than he did, and uh, maybe not get to get the ball off as quickly as he did and. Um, you know, you had an interesting uh, you had an interesting tweet that you saw that uh, Deion Sanders said that what was it? Every time Devontae Smith uh, catches a ball against Sean Wade, he's taking money out of Sean no, Wade's pocket. No, it was Shannon Sharp. Or Shannon Sharp. He said it, with every catch. It sounds like something Deion, Deion Sanders would with say. With every catch, time. Devontae Smith is taking money out of Sean Wade's pocket, and you know I believe that. I don't think Sean Wade had a good season by any means. He had a, the pick six against Indiana that turned that game around or secured it. Yeah. Uh, and there, there's no doubt he has cover skills. We all know that. I just saw at certain times, you know, I'm not. I never ripped a college kid that wasn't being paid except for maybe a lack of effort and I'm not going to accuse him of a lack of effort but, but sure at times it sure appears that way and it, 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 it yeah. did last night on the one I think it was the sideline route where he's trailing Devontae Smith I don't see him running full speed so I don't know what's up with him and uh, you know I, I will be shocked if he's a top 20 pick uh, you know scouts examine good on good great on great and they're going to look at that last night now he's got a combine left you know Everybody's glad he came back. I think he's glad he came back. He said he's glad he came back. And I never like to project NFL uh, status anyway, so it's probably, you know, it's irrelevant as far as I'm concerned. And thank him for coming back. And, and you know, the, the win and revenge against Clemson alone it was worth coming back for, I would say, because his final play as his college career would have been targeting against Trevor Lawrence, and they came back and beat him. Yeah. So that, that had to be satisfying. Yeah. I'm not going to sit here and accuse anybody of loafing, especially a defensive player who never left the field last night, uh, at least when Ohio State was on defense. You know, uh, wide receivers come in and out of games all the time. They're fresh. Sometimes you just cut, get caught. You, you get caught in the flip-flop, and it looks like uh, things happen. But he got caught in the flip-flop a few times without a doubt this season. If you notice uh, – my man, uh, Jeff Snook, quickly has flipped the script. Uh, number one, the sunglasses. We're sitting there on the beach at uh, up near Pompano, just uh, Lauderdale by the sea. Uh, we've been here for several days. Great uh, ocean view ocean view room. And and uh, we the other night, we got to watch Cleveland pull off. What? Was that an upset, Cleveland? Yeah, it was a great upset yeah. because they didn't hardly practice for two weeks. and. And one at Pittsburgh. And they're without their head coach who calls the plays, who's a great play caller, and they go into Pittsburgh and win. And uh, no, that's a tremendous something. No, I'm wearing sunglasses because, 
you know, if I get less than five hours sleep, we got home last night at 2 a.m. I, you know, the yeah. name Mike Tyson comes up, and what I mean by that, I used to cover pro boxing. So did black, I. By the way. Yeah. Uh, I got two black eyes in the morning if I don't get enough sleep, so <laughs> you don't want to be looking at those right now. But uh, I look like I went three rounds with Mike Tyson this morning, and this is because I am making the transition. Uh, my Browns uh, facing the Chiefs this weekend, and I got a feeling they're going to face their own Alabama. I was going to say, man. <laughs> so hopefully uh, they can hang tight and get some turnovers and pull off another upset. Not optimistic, but I'm hoping. If there's a pro team that looks like Alabama from last night, it definitely the Kansas City Chiefs with Tyreek Hill, Sammy Watkins Jr., and uh, Patrick Mahomes. Uh, but you know, we'll see how that goes. My middle kid. Uh, Corey May was ecstatic the other night as he said, pinch me, I'm dreaming, as uh, Cleveland pulled off that major victory. And, you know, they got the lead and hung on Sloopy. I wanted to ask you this, you know, you and I, like I said, have been around. We've been watching college football, heck, me, for six decades. I'm not going to call you that old yet, but you're getting close, my brother. Uh, Eight-team playoff, would that work? Well, it would always work in the sense they're going to make more money and the ratings would be high, TV ratings. I don't think it's feasible as far as the athletes go. I don't um, either. That Clemson game, excuse me, in the Sugar Bowl was one of the hardest hitting games I've ever seen. My seat in the Superdome was in the rafters and I could hear the pads popping all the way up there repeatedly. And Ohio State players would tell you that was a physical game. They were carrying people off, even on the Clemson side, almost every other play. On AstroTurf, it's a faster game. Uh, and Wait a minute. Football isn't war, but it's about as close as you get to it. Yeah, if you ever stand on the sideline, I always equated it to 22 Volkswagen starting their engine and hitting each other every play and doing it over and over again for about 160 plays a game. Yeah. But anyway, uh, so if they come now and they play the title game. Can you imagine the winner having to go play one more game? I mean, nope. it's just too physical. It's not the NFL. They're not getting paid. I'll put up this argument. Not only that, here's the other thing. There aren't a good enough eight good teams to win a national title every year. This Agreed. year this year there was probably three. It's always Ohio State, Clemson, and Alabama. The big drop off from three to four. So, you know, why put Cincinnati and those teams in the playoff when some people think they deserve it? They have no chance to win it. And, uh, it, you know, the, the group of five versus the power five is a big drop off to me. I just think, it, and, and I my, my other argument is, it nullifies the importance of conference championship games and and rivalries. If Ohio State and Michigan, like in years past, have been good enough to make the playoff, and they play this rivalry game, and the winner wins the game and has bragging rights for a year, I mean, what gives that loser the right three weeks later maybe have a rematch in a playoff? And if you expand it to eight, yeah. you're going to see Auburn, Alabama a lot of years. You're going to see Ohio State, Michigan a lot of years if they ever get their act together with Jim Harbaugh or maybe another coach and other rivalries where they're going to rematch or, or, or get in it even though they lost a rivalry game and didn't make their conference championship game. These these games need to matter. That's what has always made college football a step above the NFL. The games matter. They matter in November. The, the rivalry games matter, and the conference championship games matter. It's a quasi-playoff for the conference championship games. Yeah. So that's the way I look at it. I think it. I hope they stay at four, but with the way money is and TV ratings, who knows? Who knows where they'll go? I agree 100%. You and I have had this discussion many times. I was happy with the BCS with two game, with two teams because finally at least you had the top two teams in the country. They had to win the championship. That's why I put Nick Saban's uh, seven titles. I already had him ahead of uh, Bear Bryant uh, in right. a sense of – you had to go out. This wasn't right. a political machine. You had to go out and win those titles on the field, and he's had seven teams do that. Astounding, really, when you think about it. When we look back on this 20 years from now, if I'm still around, I know you will be. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. You're not that much junior to me, but I digress. Bottom line is, when we look back on this 20 years from now, you're going to be going, my goodness. You know? Well, you know, I remember. And, and it hadn't ended, you know. I remember voting the AP poll as you do. Yeah. And we would pick a national champion every year, and we had split polls all the time. 97 was the last one with Michigan and Nebraska, and let's face it, Nebraska would have clobbered that team, but Brian Greasy and the Wolverines claimed the national title in 97 yeah. by beating a poor Washington State team in the Rose Bowl. But at least we got rid of that. They play it on the field now. I like the BCS too, but at the same time, if the BCS was still going on in 2014, Ohio State would have finished on the outside looking in. Correct. And by the end of the year, they were good enough and got hot enough to win it all. 
So, you know, I think this number is just right. I really do. The winners play one extra game. So you only got two teams out of 135 teams playing one extra game. Yeah. And it still hasn't diminished the bowls that much where the, the other New Year New Year's Six Bowls are relevant. And if you go, that's the other thing. You go to eight teams, all those New Year's Six Bowls, you either got to incorporate them or they become, they will have so many players opting out. Uh, so they do yeah. it now anyway. They get the whole game's changed. But uh, anyway, I just hope it doesn't happen. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I agree with you 100% for all kinds of reasons. But, you know, just like this year, four is almost a perfect number because if it hadn't been, if it had been two again, it had been, been Alabama and Clemson for the national championship. And uh, we saw what Ohio State did to Clemson. Ohio State did to Clemson what Alabama did to Ohio State. Yeah, and, uh, exactly. And that, that wouldn't have been fun. Uh, you know, just moving on quickly. Is this the last time we're going to see a team like this, though? With, I mean, I know Nick Saban had something to do with getting these players, Najee Harris, Devontae Smith, et cetera, to return for another season. But is this the last time we're going to see maybe a super team like this? What, well, I'm not sure about what's your that. Call? I mean, because like Ohio State showed this year, it is so hard yeah. to have a great offense and a respectable, if not really good, defense on the same college football team anymore, even at Clemson, Alabama, and Ohio State. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not. I can't say never, but you know, look at Ohio State. If they'd have had uh, uh, Chase Young and, and Fuller and Arnett and and uh, uh, Akuda come back Akuda. this year, oh, yeah. I mean, you're looking at a different defense. And uh, yeah, so uh, you know, you just got to have the right culture. Probably the three best cultures in football, or the three best programs in football, which is Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State. Their culture is they want to play for their school, they want to come back, and yet they produce more NFL players than anybody else. So they always face that tough decision. They don't always make the right decision. I see time and time again, guys should come back for one more year. They don't realize they're getting bad advice, first of all. But if they realize the NFL salary structure on rookie contracts, if you improve your spot any in the first round, anywhere from eight to ten picks, you have compensated yourself for the extra year that you're giving up, and they never realize that. Yeah. It is all slotted salary, and I, I gosh, I wish I could advise half of them, because not only do you get your senior year in college or your extra year in college, and you're playing it, because you always regret it if you don't, once you get older, they make up the money if they improve their draft stock. Yeah. I've talked to so many 50 to 80 year olds that played at Ohio State, what they wouldn't give for one more ball game, let alone one more season in that stadium, they would pay a million dollars for. So it's just, but you can't get inside the head of a 21 year old who's looking at riches and endorsements and everything else that goes to the NFL. It's like Orlando Pace said on my podcast a couple of weeks ago. I mean, uh, you know, it's this this is the time of your life when you're a college football player. You know, you just wish these guys could be compensated a little bit more. Uh, a lot more maybe than what they're getting now. That's coming around the corner, name, image, and likeness. But it's once you get to the NFL, it's all about production. It's all about you know either getting the job done or being replaced by someone else. The team camaraderie is never the same after you leave college football. It's a business, and uh, so it's unfortunate. But you know, like like you said, the, the jeopardy of coming back. You saw Wyatt Davis helped off the field uh, the other night. You saw last night you saw Devontae Smith suffer maybe a broken bone in his right hand mm -hmm. on just a regular kind of big time hit. Uh, we saw Trey Sermon leave after the first two plays with a, apparently a broken collarbone they suffered on the first play and uh, on this side actually. And uh, the jeopardy these guys face when you play football though, you can see why there is an impetus to leave early. Yeah, you can at the same time. I, you know, you mentioned Trey Sermon. I would really like to see him come back. You know, he really came on yeah. the last three ball games, start with the Michigan State game, and I think he ought to come back uh, as, I don't know what his stock would be, maybe late first or second round pick, and I'm not even sure of that. If he would come back, what I just mentioned, if he would come back and put together a 1,500-yard season and, and work on his speed and everything else that goes into it, he's the type of guy that could jump up 10 to 15 slots and make up the money that he would get as a rookie and so when you look at your first contract, he would make more in the long run than he would if he if he comes out this year. That's yeah. a guy I hope I hope he gets good advice and does that. I'm not optimistic, but uh, he's he's one candidate I think should come back for another year. Yeah, Austin Ward and I were talking about you know from my buddy from Letterman Row and uh, who's usually on this program, but we're sort of like uh, seats. Yeah, we're sort of in in uh, in transit in different ways uh, today as we record this. But you know, 
sitting there from that angle we got to sit at from the southwest corner of the field as opposed to being on the 50 yard line last night you you saw several plays where master Teague the third for one reason or another didn't see the cutback that was there and it was wide open spaces quite a few times kind of ran to the point of attack and even with his own blocking schemes you know your little peripheral vision man if you can just pick that up right there that guy isn't coming down like he should be boom he squirt through there trey sermon was seeing those things the last couple of games especially against clemson so yeah but you're right from a from a prestige standpoint it might behoove him to come back but you know he left the field last night with an injury that could happen in the first game of the regular season that's the jeopardy of these guys uh, that's what the, the thoughts that go through their minds and you know whoever's advising them their minds you know you could also kind of lose it all if you come back and I understand that but with name image and likeness right around the corner for these guys you know at least there'll be some compensation well let's face it a running back a collarbone's not going to affect him as as far as draft status no it's going to keep you from playing for as long one, as you don't get your ACL or your knee torn right. up or broken ankle anything to do with your legs as a running back it's not going to affect Trey Sermon's draft status. Right. So, and now it might hamper him as far as working at the combine and working out. But no, what, what you're referring to, to me, I call vision. The best running backs, the greatest running backs have the best vision. Emmett Smith was, he was one of the slowest running backs in the NFL. Yeah. He still holds the NFL record for rushing yards because his vision was better than anybody else. Yeah. So that's one thing Master Teague needs. The, the word there is run where they ain't. Yeah, well, Go ahead. Master yeah. Teague, obviously, through film study, needs to work on that. But when I sit a lot of times the upper deck, you can see the holes where they are, and he doesn't, he's a different type back. He's yes. a big, bruising back. And I thought it was, the light bulb was coming off for him earlier this year, but last night he had a couple runs maybe there that he didn't see. He did on the touchdown. He oh, popped yeah. that outside, which he needs to do more of. But he's trying to use his physicality, and, and yet he's still not breaking a lot of tackles. But uh, he's got a lot of talent. He just doesn't have the ability to make people miss like Trey Sermon did. And Trey, really, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen an improvement from the first game to the last game like that young man, that I mean, he just really turned it on, and I never saw that in him the first three games when we watch Ohio State football, but he was just tremendous at the end of the year. You know, you and I have some great conversations and uh, about football. I mean, that's <clears throat> you're one of, you're one of my best friends, and one of the reason is we think alike a lot. You know, and uh, as uh, you mean about picking out good restaurants and so forth. Yeah, picking out good restaurants, uh, having a good time. Uh, eating from the appetizer menu, which is just as filling and gives you a little bit more variety. And now you're going to make us out to be cheap. <clears throat> no, we're not. No, as a matter of fact, we're not cheap. That's actually, when you really total it up, that's more expensive when you get right down to it. Just so you know, I always <clears throat> take Tim to the best restaurants wherever, whatever town we're in, you know, and I got to, I got to pry him to get away from fast food and some, some, uh, no, but you do a great job. I mean, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I treasure our friendship, you know, and uh, your wife's always nice to me. I don't know why she is, but uh, that is the way because it is. Because you get me out of the house and get me out of her hair. Yeah. It's kind of like when I go off somewhere, my wife gets almost giddy with excitement, with happiness. <laughs> you mean she's packing your bag and putting it yeah. in the front door, right? Yes. Yeah, when I get home from this, she's probably going, oh, you're already back? Where's Ohio State play next week, honey? Where are you yeah, going? Yeah, exactly. Uh, something else, you, anything else you want to cover with this? Because you and I had so many conversations over the last many days um, about football, I mean, you know, is there a, is there a, I don't know, a bounce in your step that the Cleveland Browns, for example, are in the playoffs again? Hey, you got to be in it to win it. They've got a shot against Kansas City. Let's put it that way. But well, uh, that was one of the more stirring wins in Browns franchise history uh, the other night at Pittsburgh. Just, yeah, it didn't it didn't go swimmingly in the second half, but they they you know they held on and got the job done. The bottom line is they won a playoff game. Crazy. Let me just group about 10 days together. Ohio State's had this Clemson onus on their head going back to when I was in school in 1978 with Woody Hayes. Game they should have won, by the way. Yeah. And then they had uh, the 31-0 game, the Orange Bowl down here with Braxton Miller. They should have won, won. won that game. Yeah. And then last year, definitely, they were a better team than Clemson. We diagnosed six or seven plays. If any one of the six or seven go Ohio State's way, they win the game. Yeah. If three or four go their way, they win by three touchdowns. Well, they won by three touchdowns in the Sugar Bowl. Those games weren't that much different except for those crucial plays. So they were better than Clemson, but they're 0-4. So they got that off their back. So if this season was worth anything, it's getting the Clemson monkey off their back and getting some revenge against Clemson, winning another Big Ten title. Now you fast forward 10 days, the Browns, 
big monkey on their backs, the Steelers, especially in Pittsburgh. So they go to Pittsburgh against all odds, not practicing, facility closed, without their head coach, without assistant coaches, without their Pro Bowl guard, and they upset the Steelers in Big Ben. How satisfying can those two games be in a row? So now comes the edge, Reality. Off, the, edge off the cliff, Reality which check. is Alabama and the Chiefs. So we'll see what happens Sunday. Like I said, they've already accomplished something none of us thought they would accomplish. They won at Pittsburgh. They're in the playoffs. So it's it's baby steps, and those are big baby steps. By the way, you know my favorite place that we ate the whole time we were together here the last many days was that <clears throat> after we drove by mar lago Remember, and I asked yeah. I asked the guy who was working out front, hey, who lives here? And he seriously answered. He said, the president of the United States. Hands, he threw up his hands like Joey Boza. Yeah, the, the president. president. Yeah. And... Uh, as we laughed all the way down the street. But we had we had uh, lunch there right on the water uh, up in Lantana or wherever that the was. The old Key Lime House, yeah. one of my personal favorites. The old Key Lime House in Lantana, Florida is actually the oldest restaurant in the state of Florida. Uh, oh, built, I did not know yeah, that. Built in the 1800s. It's an old uh, wood house. But, I, you know, to me, I moved to Florida for one reason. I wanted to be near the beach back in 1984, near the beach, near the water. And that's a, that's a waterfront restaurant. And yeah. It, and on the east coast of Florida, it's unlike the Gulf Coast of Florida. We don't have many waterfront restaurants because the, the property values are so high, they develop condos on them, not restaurants. You know, I'm a, I'm a foodie. I love great restaurants. I love great wine lists. And uh, so I tend to migrate ter- toward those. And a great place to hang out. Bob Brzezinski, former Ohio, former Ohio State superstar Good back wings. in the mid-70s. You know, he's, his brews... Uh, what's it called Brews those, House. Those yeah. are the best wings in South Florida yeah. is the Brews Room chain of Bob Brzezinski, number 84, defensive end for Woody Hayes. He used to be a good friend of mine. I haven't talked to him for a while. I uh, hope Bob's doing well, but he's very, very successful in the restaurant business. I didn't know we were going to do a restaurant review today. No, we didn't. I just wanted to get your drift on that because I really did like that Key Lime House, and uh, I would advise people because it kind of captures everything you want, reasonable reasonable prices, really good food, and you're you're sitting over the water. You know, which we were, and right. uh, that's the coolest. <laughs> hey, one last thing. Uh, what do you do if you're Ryan Day now? You've you've had that Clemson game of a year ago, which got you knocked out. You got your team. You got them. You you, you drove them to a shot at the national championship, and you get waxed, uh, 52 to 24. And a lot of these guys won't be around next year. What do you do if you're Ryan Day? We all know Nick Saban. He's you know uh, basking in the afterglow of a, yet another national championship. Here's Ryan Day in his first two years as a head coach. He's had his team almost right there, but not good enough. Well, that's the sad thing. A year ago, I still think they might have been the best team, and excuse me, won a national title if they get by Clemson. I still, like I said, I still think they would have beaten LSU. We'll never know because they never played. So yeah. it's sad they didn't get the chance. But all you do when you get beat like that is you dust yourself off and you look at the film, you see where we can improve. Now you start working on your next quarterback, whoever that's going to be, because Justice Fields is going to go. You build your team from the foundation of your great recruiting classes. Uh, you just keep doing what you're doing. He's always going to succeed there the way he recruits. He's a very, very bright coach. He's only 41. I hope Ohio State can keep him for years to come. I think he loves it there. It's one of the best five jobs in foot, all of football, in my opinion, including the NFL. So I don't know. You know, you just got to keep relying on the foundation of your culture. He's got a great culture that Ur- Urban Meyer established. Uh, Jim Trestle also had a good culture. So for the last 20 years, that's what's sad about this year. To me, the big void this year was another win over Michigan. My, I think it's 57 to 50 to 6. And my goal before they put me in the grave is I wanted that to be even or at least Ohio State to be up by one. So that's eight more games. And this would have been one of them uh, without a doubt. So, you know, we got to wait another year for them to get another notch on Michigan's belt. So, uh, yeah. As we talk right now, our final thing, as we talk right now, there's a good chance Urban Meyer, the way we heard it last night especially, is uh, going to be the next head coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars, mm-hmm. his first foray into the National Football League. I want this succinct because we're running out of time. Will he succeed as a as an NFL head coach like he succeeded 
in college football. Well, that second part of the sentence, like he succeeded. Uh, yeah, you know, like the, he, well, it's winter. The NFL, it's winter to go home in the NFL. The NFL's not built that way. What Urban would have to adjust to is when he goes nine and seven, and those seven on the right side of the column, can he live with those? And uh, you know, we don't even know he's taking the job. You know, I talked to him last night, and yeah. I, I didn't even bring up the subject. We were talking about something else, and I didn't even think about it until you walked. Well, let's play like, he, let's play like he's a... Uh, there's a good chance he's taking the job. I'm asking you that question. Okay. Uh, I, I would never bet against him because he's a big picture guy. He knows how to hire the best people. Uh, you, know, you know, one of the best hires he could make would be whatever special teams coach he Bill Parcells philosophy all those years when he took a job was to make up two to four wins in the special teams department and Urban's, Urban's very good at special teams. It, 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 uh, two of his biggest hires will be offensive defense coordinator. He's got to have some NFL staffers on there because it is a different game. And until you go through it and the rules and just, every, I mean, there's literally a thousand differences. It is not the same game. It's not even close. It's like the NBA to college basketball. Yes. Just different things that you learn. And that's a big stepping stone. That is a big learning curve. So he just needs to surround himself with the best people that can help transition him to the game. And as I said, if he takes it, I, don't, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't even ask him. So Yeah, well, that, 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 that's the big if, of course. I See, people say he would freak out if he loses five or six or eight games a year. If he loses eight, yeah. But you lose five or six, you're in the playoffs probably. And uh, he's smart enough to understand you're not going to win every game in the National Football League. What will drive him nuts is a team that commits a bunch of errors, things like that. He will be on top of that, etc. I think he's got a a great shot at succeeding if he if he can, like you said, stay. I think he's gained some patience, uh, for want of another term, uh, in this little interim he's had out of coaching. And if indeed he does take that job, I th I think he I think he will succeed because he knows enough people. He knows talent. Uh, I think there's. I think those are the two key parameters for a uh, big time successful uh, NFL coach. Well, let me add: if he's ever going to succeed or take a job, this is the one to take. You've got Trevor Lawrence coming out. You have Correct. a lot of draft picks. You have a lot of salary cap room. The largest salary cap by far he, room in the in the NFL. He and his family just built a house in Siesta Key, Florida, which is a four hour drive, so his family could come see him off. And he loves warm weather. Uh, th there's things lined up if they give him the control of over personnel and draft that he would probably demand that he that if he doesn't take this job I don't see him ever taking another job nobody's gonna approach him anymore after he dealt with Texas for a little bit there at the end of the season yeah and then uh, now with the Jaguars so he's got to make a decision and the other thing is he's got to ask himself is my legacy important my net worth might come into play there with the money they're talking about He's got plenty of money. That's the thing nowadays. These coaches either retire, resign, get fired. They, they don't have to work the next. In the old days, that's why Woody Hayes worked for 28 years at Ohio yeah. State and Bo Schembecker and those guys that are making under $100,000 a year. They had to pay their bills. They had to do something for a living. But nowadays, coaches get fired. A lot of mediocre coaches get fired every day in college football. They never ever work another day in their lives. Their net worth instantly is 20 to $40 million. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Well, like you said, Nick Saban was making 22000 a year as a full-time assistant coach at Ohio State back in 1981, early 1982, when the ax fell. And, uh, you know, and you brought up the Woody Hayes example. Ladies and gentlemen, do not turn down raises. Do not turn down raises because it not only affects you, affects it affects assistance. who is working under you. And uh, Woody Hayes, for whatever reason, Ooh. I remember I wrote a story about that, and Bobby Knight uh, sent me compliments about the fact that uh, it, it really retarded the Ohio State yeah. uh, coaching staff back in the, uh, right. in the 1980s. When, when finally Earl Bruce got the first extended contract. And uh, don't turn down races. Woody did not care about money. Woody cared about giving back, paying for, taking care of people less fortunate. Yeah. Very, very, very educated man. You never hear me say a bad word about him. No. But he did not care about the almighty green. And yeah, Lou Holtz at Arkansas maybe could have taken that job if he wanted, but that was one of the issues that came up was what they were paying the assistants oh, yeah. at the time. Oh, yeah. Earl Bruce would have told you for years the assistants were underpaid and he had to beg him to open the pocketbook so yeah, yeah. That, anyway, well, that, anyway that's a long time ago we yeah. di we digress that would be a great podcast just us talk about that stuff because it was crazy way back when uh, in its own right but you know what appreciate you jeff for coming on the tim may podcast again thanks for having me again. and uh, uh ladies and gentlemen we'll be back next week to sort of like look even more forward 
about what's going to happen with this Ohio State football program. Well, by then, we'll have a maybe a clearer picture of who's leaving, who might be staying. Uh, Here's what I wish. I hope we come back next year and we're not wearing masks and the stadium is full and things return to normal and there's 105,000, 106,000 in Ohio Stadium and we all got the vaccine or whatever it takes. That's what I'm hoping for this New Year's. You I'm know, tired of it all. That's kind of like when I'm sitting here, I'm listening to that. I'm like, I'm like Santa Claus at Christmas. He's hearing all these similar wishes. You know, no one wants to go through what we just went through in 2020, hangover into 2021. But I understand uh, the next couple of weeks I'll be getting my vaccine. Good. I'm in line, man. Good for you. Well, you're the, of the age that you could qualify. Exactly. I, I don't. Yeah. See, I don't mind. I don't mind you making fun of how old I am because it means I'm older than you and more wise. Do you, you remember, know what? Let me ask you. When you covered Chick Harley, was he as good as they say he was? He was pretty damn good. Right. Let me put it that way. And uh, uh, I don't know. Not, not, I a great, just picture, not a great interview, though. I could just picture Tim outside Ohio Field on High Street and Ohio State fans, if you've never seen The Rock, on uh, 17th Avenue North. Go look at it. The Chick Harley played there as Ohio Field, and I could see Tim outside that, that little field with his notebook talking to Chick. Yeah. I've also, you know, his gravestone is one of the great gravestones known to me, and then there's a little memorial to him over on the east side of Columbus, and people, it's like a little vacant, well, not vacant, it's like a lot there with a little uh, remembrance of him, and it's really cool, man. The uh, If you want to take a tour with me sometime of uh, Ohio State football, I just don't understand why there's not a, a a pantheon of statues going in and out of Ohio State well, of the Heisman name. Trophy winners, of the great coaches who've coached there. Because Ohio State does it a little different. They have their names on the side of the facade at the closed end of the stadium, and not everybody needs to build a statue. I mean, Florida's building statues outside Florida Field for guys that are 26 years old that want a Heisman. Let's face it, uh, that to me that seems a little overboard. But uh, I disagree totally. You know, grab and run with your tradition is and, the way I look at it. And we have something called Buckeye Grove. Take a walk through there and look at the All-American trees and the plaques at the base of those. If fans haven't done that, there's a lot of history in that campus. And, uh, you know, we don't need to build statues everywhere. That uh, The pigeons sit on them. And it's just, yeah, I, I, it's unattractive. Uh, power washer, ladies and gentlemen. Think about it, Jeff. Mm -hmm. You can use one. But you know what? Until next time, until next week, this is Tim May with the Tim May Podcast. Thinking my friend, Jeff Snook, longtime friend Jeff Snook. Until then, we'll see you then. Happy New Year.